Welcome everyone to CUNY BA's first student showcase. Um, I am Kim Hartswick, the academic director of CUNY Baccalaureate for Unique and Interdisciplinary Studies and your host. Um, I know we, uh, we have joining us this afternoon, not only CUNY BA students, but also alumni, faculty mentors, and administrators, including uh, Jim Meiskins, the president of the Graduate School and University Center, and acting vice president and dean Brian Peterson, who will be offering remarks at the close of the program. Again, welcome to you all. Several shout outs are necessary because without the efforts of CUNY BA graduate fellows, this showcase would not be taking place. In particular, uh, Joanna Smolensky has taken on the leadership and organization of today's event. And she, along with her fellow fellows, uh, Marino Mugiar Baldoki, as well as Teresa Cormi and Manny Gonzalez, must be given well-deserved credit, not only for this showcase, but for helping our students and staff weather the unexpected transition into our present virtual world. As all of you know, CUNY BA students are remarkable individuals who are willing and able to take control of their academic programs by collaborating with faculty mentors in developing a course of study that is individualized and typically interdisciplinary. As a result, they are encouraged to go beyond classroom study, to delve into academic research, performance, community service, and other avenues of interest. The four students we will be seeing and hearing from today are truly representative of all those pursuing degrees through CUNY BA. They cover a range of topics and disciplines, and as a group, they represent as well four CUNY colleges, Queens College, the College of Staten Island, Hunter College, and the City College of New York. I will introduce each student who will then take about seven or eight minutes to present their work. You can submit questions through Zoom chat during each presentation by replying to the chat moderator, who in fact is a real person, in the Zoom chat box. After each of the presentations, Marino will then ask as many of your questions as possible. Uh, one more thing for full disclosure, this presentation is being recorded, so all your audio and video has been muted, but your name may appear. So, let's get started. Lauren Cassidy is a Macaulay Honors Scholar at Queens College and became a CUNY BA student only this semester pursuing a degree in live entertainment and media. She was drawn to CUNY BA while looking for a major that satisfied her desire to study and train in all artistic aspects of live performance, production and promotion as an independent artist. Since the age of nine, Lauren has been an active singer, actress, dancer and writer. She has always deeply felt and acknowledged the power art and words have to inspire people and to change the world. Her three passions in life are art, psychology, and connection to people. In all of her artistic endeavors, Lauren uses music, visuals, and words to tell a story that holds a deeper meaning and can offer life lessons. It is a true pleasure to welcome Lauren Cassidy. Thank you. Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Lauren Cassidy. Family is a very meaningful and influential aspect of life. I'd like to take you back to the 1950s, where we saw the emergence of the ideal family unit. Angel Face tells the story of Angel Anderson, a 16-year-old girl living in the idealized world of 1950s America with her dysfunctional family. 
The song describes the Andersons and their warped perceptions of and relationships with one another. The music video introduces each member of the family by having them pose for a series of portraits. This displays how the family strives to be seen as perfect, as most families did during the 50s. TV shows and instructional films from that decade taught white middle class families how they should behave. The three rules for children were obey authority, control your emotions, and conform in actions and appearance. Anything outside of this was seen as not normal. Struggles commonly found within many modern families are the same today as they were back then. The only difference is that families in the 50s that were struggling were trained to conceal it. This song is a point of realization for a child of that decade who dealt with family issues. For the first time in her life, Angel is realizing that her family is not what is considered normal and now must cope with the consequences of her troubling past. She explains how forcing children to project an image of perfectionism is damaging to their relationship with their parents and their relationship with their own self. This song is the first single I'm releasing as an introduction to a concept album that will continue the story of these characters and cover topics such as family issues, child abuse, mental illness, and finding forgiveness and autonomy. My goal with this project is to use the platform of pop music to discuss serious issues and help those who have felt similar to feel less alone, more understood, and eventually empowered. We will now be viewing a small portion of the video that portrays this family's relationship. Please visit my YouTube channel, Laura Nicole Cassidy, to see the full version. Thank you. And everyone says, oh my gosh, you have the perfect daughter for her age. She is so mature. I need to know your secret on how you made the perfect little girl. Treated like some kind of prize, and now you're just dead inside. Daddy's little girl or a mama's boy Either way you feel like a dress-up toy Pressure rises and a crisis of identity Feeling less like a person and more like a trophy Like father, like daughter, like mother, like son Words only hurt till you've heard enough Grow up to be what they choose for you so desperate to please has turned you into Thank you. Yes, so now we're going to open it up to questions and I am the chat moderator. So feel free to write to me privately in the chat box. Uh, if you go to and then you'll see chat moderator as a name, please send me your questions. And
And Lauren, as you can see in the chat, they are showering you with praise. Yes, thank you very much, everyone. It was a labor of love, a passion <laughs> project. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and Lauren, if you have actually access to, I know I've seen a couple of people asking for the link to the, um, I have the link to the, the full video on YouTube in the PowerPoint, but if you want to drop that in the chat box as well, then um, more people can check out your channel. Oh, sure. I mean, I don't have the link on me, but I can access it real right. quick. So Lauren, we have the first question. And Great. the first question comes from Mary Pearl, who's asking, what drew you to the 1950s? So I have always been interested in vintage culture, everything from the 40s all the way to the 70s and even the 80s. I love exploring those different decades. But the 50s in particular, I had done some research on that time period for a class. And I discovered all these old films by Coronet and Encyclopedia Britannica that actually served as instructional films to teach families how to behave and how to act, specifically children and teens. And what I found out in my research is that a lot of things that modern families deal with or struggle with, a lot of problems that modern families face and that people think are only modern problems, were actually problems that were dealt with back then as well, especially by children and teens. It's just there wasn't much known about it and people were ashamed to talk about something if it wasn't right. So I wanted to set this world and this character and this concept in that time period to kind of bring awareness to that issue and bring to light that a lot of things that people struggle with now has been happening for a long time. So, yeah. Thank you. That's a great response. Any Thank other you. questions? Okay, so we've just got another question. Okay. Did you wear a vintage dress? Uh, yes. The, so I have two outfits in that video. Um, both are vintage, like true vintage clothing that I found from, one was from a thrift shop and one was from an Etsy store. So yes, both were vintage. Very interesting. And another question for you. In what ways do you see the modern social media trend mirroring or diverging from what your research of the stereotypical 1950s white middle class family showed you? I see. So in social media specifically, there's a lot of praise for the ideal family unit of the 50s. And it's really interesting because I feel like people look upon that time period as if it was this ideal perfect world and it, it really wasn't. It's just nobody talked about the imperfect qualities of it. It's interesting that you mentioned social media because something I do want to talk about in my music is uh, mental illness and how a lot of things like depression and anxiety that people struggle with now existed back then. It's just people didn't know about it or they were ashamed to talk about it. But in social media today, there's a lot of um, the romanticization of mental illness. And we've kind of moved from being ignorant about it to almost uh, decreasing the severity of such issues and such struggles by the way that we kind of um, praise it on social media, or at least certain companies and celebrities do from what I've seen. I hope that answers your question. Yes, that absolutely does. And I'll just round it out with one final question that will link to this answer quite nicely. So what do you hope your audience is gonna take from your piece and from this experience with you? I hope that whoever watches this will be able to see themselves either in Angel Face or in another character in the story or be able to see somebody that they know and maybe they can understand themselves a little bit better or understand that person that they know that may have struggled with something similar a little bit better. That's fantastic, can't wait for the rest of the album. Thank you. <laughs> Me too. Thank you, Lauren. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Thanks so much, Lauren. Thank you, everyone. All right. Well, thank you, Lauren. Um, that was terrific. Um, our next speaker, um, we're, we're really changing gears here, so just wrap your head around this. Um, Corey Plate, a 
Thomas W. Smith Fellow and a student at the College of Staten Island, entered CUNY BA in the fall of 2019 because of his interest in creating a multidisciplinary degree in physics, neuroscience, and psychology that will be the foundation for a career as a physician and a researcher. He is the editor-in-chief of Contemporary Psychology, which is an undergraduate publication at CSI under the mentorship of Dr. Leora Yetnikov. Since the summer of 2017, he has volunteered in laboratory studies with Dr. Dan McClowski, who's at CSI, working on a project that is the subject of today's presentation about East African naked mole rats. I have to confess that I've become kind of obsessed by them. So, um, Also known after I Googled them uh, as sand puppies, which makes them sound actually more lovable to be sure, um, they are actually remarkable creatures, as you will learn, because they are resistant to cancer, can survive in an atmosphere up to 80% carbon dioxide, and may live up to 30 or more years. Corey's interest, however, is in a novel glucose transporter phenomenon that may well have implications for human diabetes research. Please welcome Corey Plate. Hi, everyone. Uh, thank you, Dr. Hartswick. Uh, I'm really excited about today's talk. It's a subject that I'm very passionate about. And the story of today's talk is really these um, African naked morads. Um, despite the unassuming name, uh, they are one of Earth's strangest and most interesting animals. Um, and today I'm going to talk to you about why um, I believe that's true. Um, and then I will tell you why I think that they could prove to be a powerful new model for diabetes. Uh, next slide. So what makes naked mole rats so special? Well, to begin with, naked mole rats are a highly social animal. Uh, they live in groups of up to hundreds of animals uh, living across generations together um, in the tight quarters of an underground colony. So you can see um, an example of them nesting together in the image on this slide. Um, this has taken place in a laboratory, but it's very similar to their natural environment. Now, this exposes them to extremely high levels of carbon dioxide um, in excess of 50 times the air that we breathe. Now, if we were to be in this kind of environment, we would find it intolerable um, and moreover, not survivable. Now, perhaps more astonishingly, naked morads can survive um, in excess of 15 minutes without any oxygen at all. Now, we believe that similar to an antioxidant, that it's possible that this low oxygen dependence uh, is part of why they live up to 50, uh, I'm sorry, up to 30 years and almost never get cancer. Now, all of these signs kind of point to an unusual metabolism, uh, which is part of why we started looking into it. And as it turns out, this is indeed the case. Uh, naked mole rats live in what we would consider a diabetic-like state. Next slide. Sorry, next slide. Oh, there we go. <laughs> so what makes this property even more interesting um, is that there's a special cast of naked mole rats called dispersers uh, who are responsible for establishing new colonies, uh, and they may not even exist in this diabetic state. Now, to explain this, uh, we need to briefly talk about insulin. Insulin is a hormone that's present in naked mole rats and humans that allows cells to uptake sugar and use it for energy. Now, it does not appear that this insulin works as it does in humans in the average naked mole rat. However, if you compare the average naked mole rat seen in the left image to dispersers seen on the right image, you can see that the dispersers are larger, paler, and often have more fat than their brothers and sisters. And unlike their brothers and sisters, they can, um, they can easily tolerate the air that we breathe. Now, this suggests that they have a working form of insulin. Next slide. Now, in our work, um, we, in order to investigate this uh, insulin difference, we compare levels of GLUT4. Now, GLUT4 is an insulin-controlled pathway for sugar into the cell. So basically, think of it like a gate and the insulin is a key, and that allows sugar to enter the cell. Now, based on our findings seen in this graph, uh, which showed levels of this transporter in naked mole rats, seen in blue, compared with mice, seen in red, we believe, pending further testing, 
that this transporter and thus insulin is less, less active in naked mole rats. Um, and this is similar to what we see in diabetes. Now, the reason we use mice as a test model for this um, comparison is because mice are a kind of go-to staple in labs um, to compare different qualities um, because they have a similar enough physiology to humans and because they are easy to care for and easy to breed. Now, if we're able to establish the opposite effect in dispersers, um, where their GLUT4 is at a normal level, uh, this would suggest a reversal in this diabetic-like condition. Um, and this is important because um, that suggests that they're able to have a switch in this functional insulin, uh, something that we don't see in diabetic patients. Next slide. Now, this is an exciting possibility because among the many amazing things that we can learn from naked mole rats, uh, suggests that they may be an excellent model for diabetic treatment. After all, it would mean that they've already found the cure. And that's um, it for my presentation. And then we have a one more slide with a graphic that kind of shows how everything got started. Well, that is absolutely fascinating and a very complex graph indeed. <laughs> so we're going to open it up. Thank you so much, Corey, for a fantastic presentation and for sharing your passion of the African naked mole rat with us. I've always thought they were super cute, but totally ignorant and naive in my knowledge of them. So now I will. They are cute. They're cute in person. <laughs> <laughs> so we have a few questions for you already. So um, what is, the first one is, what is your specific research program? So specific research clarification with that one. Sorry, one more time? And let me know if you need any clarification. Okay, um, so my specific research program, uh, I work in an undergraduate lab with the amazing Dr. Dan McCloskey. Um, all our entire lab focuses on research in uh, African naked morats because um, as you can see there, for a number of reasons, they're an interesting model um, just because they have all of these bizarre traits that seemingly have somehow coalesced into this one species out in, uh, in Kenya. Um, so we all focus on research in African naked mole rats, specifically in their um, metabolism, in their um, utilization of carbon dioxide, and uh, other exciting things that have to do with their brain. Very interesting. So... Uh, another question for you, Corey. Um, what is the next step in your research and how have the campus closure impact, how has it impacted your work? So sadly, the campus closures have impacted the work. We were in the middle of running um, Western blots uh, where we were comparing for in, uh, the average naked mole rat to mice again, um, just to confirm our findings with the graph that you saw on the previous slide. Uh, the previous slide is an ELISA, which is used to compare um, different levels of protein in um, a species. But a Western blot is a more robust test, and um, it would also help us to establish the significance of this finding. Now, once we're able to do that, the next step would be to compare the average naked mole rat to dispersers. And what we think we're going to see is that the dispersers have a similar level of GLUT4 uh, mice rather than to a lower uh, concentration of it. Oh, fascinating. I really do hope you get this research out there. It seems to have a wide ranging impact and lots of things still unknown. Um, so the final question is any like what did you find the most interesting aspect of conducting this research? Any like special little bits of knowledge that you're just like, oh my goodness, I wish other people could know about this. Anything like that that you'd like to share? Oh, I mean, the naked mora topic is simply bottomless. I mean, my favorite thing is just to get lost in all the literature that's starting to crop up about this animal. Um, I mean, they just, I, I, ha I didn't really even cover the half of it in my presentation. 
Um, this graph here shows a little bit of the complexity of this animal. Um, I made this graph when I first started my research based on a paper by Park. Um, and it incorporates several other uh, papers that I looked into. And what was interesting is that they all just led back to this GLUT4 transporter. And that's how things got started. So my favorite thing is just getting lost in the literature of these animals and seeing how they've frankly evolved a whole, whole different system for, um, for their mode of living. Corey, I hope you'll continue your passion for research. It's Thank infectious. <laughs> Thank you so much for a wonderful presentation and for this amazing work. Thank Corey. Indeed, thanks Corey. You know how much I now love these uh, mole rats, right? We, we talked about this. Yeah, uh, I and <laughs> thanks very much, I really appreciate it. Talisa uh, Velasquez, a student at Hunter College, started in CUNY BA in fall 2019, entering with a 3.93 GPA and proposing two concentrations, one in performance and the other in Latin American art. This makes a lot of sense given that Talisa was raised in Oaxaca, Mexico, where she went to museums and art galleries and became interested in dancing, singing, and acting. Her passion is on creating communal art that invites everyone to have a voice in a constant dialogue for love and justice. She has been part of theater productions that touch on themes of like immigration and otherness. She has interned and worked with organizations that use theater for storytelling and education. She hopes to join the Peace Corps after graduating and then pursuing a master's in art education or applied theater. Her presentation is about a Ch Chilean performance artist, poet, and filmmaker, Cecilia Vicuña. It is a pleasure to welcome Talisa Velasquez. Hello, my name is Salisa Velasquez, and today I'm going to be speaking about my research on the artist Cecilia Vicuña and my woven consciousness and connection to her work. Cecilia Vicuña is a poet, artist, filmmaker, and activist born in Chile. Working since the 60s, Vicuña creates site specific installations in nature, streets, and museums. She calls her work transformative acts that bridge the gap between art and life. Next slide, please. In my research, I have gathered four major themes in Vicuña's work. Participatory practice, compilation, dissecting meanings of words, and exploring and pushing the boundaries of art forms. The reason I've discovered and obsessed with Vicuña's work is because I'm currently taking a class called Research Methods of Art History. I was assigned one of her least researched works that was recently included in the MoMA's expansion called Que es para usted la poesía? Next slide. It's a 22 minute compilation of photography and video created in Bogota, Colombia in 1980. In this video, she interviews children, artists, police, intellectuals, prostitutes on the street, asking the simple question, what is poetry to you? Each response is equally magical, but I'll quickly share two responses. A prostitute says, Anything can cause inspiration. Sex is poetry. An artist says, poetry is a revolutionary dance. It's what kids or crazy people do. I presented in my research that not only does this video show Vicuña's participatory practice and interest in compilation, but she really focuses on dissecting the meaning of poetry. Poetry's definition can perhaps mean something written or that rhymes, but, but Vicuña really shows that everyone has their own specific definition of poetry. As soon as I saw this video, I couldn't stop thinking, what would I have responded to her? What would people in 2020 respond? What would people in New York City respond? I was so curious that I was ready to go hit the streets and ask people the same question. But since the quarantine happened, I haven't had the honor of doing that. The only person who I've been spending so much time with is myself. So I've used Vicuña's template, I've, I've used Vicuña's question as a template for exploring myself, 
What brings me joy? What causes me inspiration? Next slide, please. I have discovered that poetry is a living, breathing thing that every day presents a new meaning to me. I want to continue her legacy, her discovery, her curiosity. So I've created a small compilation of investigative silly moments throughout my day, responding to Vicuña's question, ¿Qué es para usted la poesía? Poetry, a fearless, curious, small, quiet, hidden moments of the human experience. La poesía no es más de lo que dicen por ahí, lo que hacen los locos y los niños, lo más natural del ser humano. This video is not as important as the lesson that Vicuña has taught me. She's taught me to listen, to listen to the poetry around the world, around my world. I now invite you all, next slide please, sorry. I now invite you all to ask yourself the same question. What is poetry to you? See if you can create for yourself a new definition of poetry. If you want to make me really happy and want to participate, uh, you can email me here. Uh, any submission would be really exciting for me. Thank you. Wonderful presentation, Talisa. Very, very interesting. Inviting people to sit with themselves and see what new meaning they discover from the same old rose, right? So we have a bunch of questions coming in. So first, why do you think uh, Latina poets are so comfortable with a cross-disciplinary approach to the arts? And this person is also thinking about Carmen Boyosa and visual artist Magali Lara, who have also collaborated on joint works for decades in Mexico. And why do you, how do you think this relates to you as well? Um, I don't personally know the work that, was, that you just mentioned, but... Um, I would say that they're not afraid to just have a constant question of the reality of the reality. And I think sometimes that question can manifest through many forms. Uh, and I think, I don't know specifically to poets in Latin America, but I think what I've learned is that people tend to listen to their surroundings more um, and that listening helps you kind of grasp what you want to learn from the world. And I think that can manifest through multiple mediums of art. Very well said. The next question is, uh, the visual and the oral qualities of your video are compelling and beautiful. Can you talk about how your art history studies intersect with your creative practice a little bit more, please? Yeah, I think that um, not only do I consider myself an artist, but I am also like 
and a, a highly curious person. And I think that that studying art history really allows me to, to understand what I'm looking at comes from. And I think, for example, if you go to the MoMA or any museum and you look at a work of art and I wonder, how did this artist create this and why and what, were, what, were, what, were, what was happening during the time that they were creating these things. So I think that art history allows me to use my curiosity to understand the work that I'm looking at. And then also while I'm learning their history, it allows me to kind of take pieces of it and incorporate it to my own work. That's beautiful. Uh. I also have my questions as well that I wanted to ask all of our presenters, but let me ask uh, the last one. Um, so could you talk about why you chose this Chilean artist in particular? Yeah, um, well, so in my class of research methods of art history, we were all assigned an artist in mm -hmm. class to do research on. And I, we we had certain artists that we can choose from but i as soon as i saw that her um her name was on the list i sent the email quickly because i've seen her work before and i think we're very similar and i think i was really excited to learn from her a lot i think this process has been a learning process for me to not be afraid i think vicuña represents someone who's not afraid to challenge the norm who's not afraid to just go out and create who's not afraid to go up to people on the street and ask them questions and i i want to be that person and i was really excited that she was on the list and i've been kind of obsessing about her <laughs> <laughs> sounds like a very healthy kind of obsession <laughs> thank you so much thank you thank you he said it, so that was great. Um, and for our final presentation, Derek Bassler in 2013 earned a BA in Dramatic Literature and Creative Writing from NYU. And three years later, having bought a one way ticket to Turkey, he began a physical and personal journey through the Near East, inspiring him to become a force for positive change. A student at City College and a Thomas W. Smith Fellow, he entered CUNY BA in 2018, proposing two areas of concentration, politics, media, and culture, and Middle Eastern studies. When he completes his CUNY BA degree, he will be attending Central European University for Sociology and Social Anthropology with an advanced certificate in visual theory and practice. He will be discussing his project titled Blood Boundaries, undertaken in July 2019 in a small Albanian village. Please welcome Derek Basler. Thank you, Kim. Uh, and I also just want to send a very heartfelt thank you to everyone for showing up, my professors, my mentors, my mother, showing up, I mean, it really means a lot. So, if we can go to the first slide, please. So located in the Chapoya region, on the traditional territory of the Nikai tribe, which is one of more than 60 different clans found within the Northern Albania mountains, lies a remote village called Sodai Eprem. I first visited Sodai on my own in the summer of 2017. While I was traveling across Albania, I heard rumors of the tribes in the Northern mountains. These rumors mostly pertain to their violent practices, such as intertribal warfare and centuries-old blood feuds. I decided I had to examine this for myself. With my time in the village, these rumors seemed dispelled entirely. I experienced an enormously rich culture and a hospitality unlike anything else I have witnessed before or since. I returned in the summer of 2019, leading a small film crew, including myself, a camera operator, and a translator to begin filming a documentary about the village, the initial stages of which I'm presenting today. Go to the next slide, please. To understand the village of Sodai and the nature of the project I'm currently undertaking, we must understand a little bit of the history of Albania, to which the history of Sodai and its residents is inextricably linked. One of the most prominent figures is a man by the name of Leka Dukajini, who lived during the 15th century. He codified a book of laws that dictated the standards of conduct, known as the Kanuni, which are still strictly adhered to in the village to this day. 
The codes include matters of hospitality, intertribal marriage, and the infamous blood feuds I heard so much about. Next, uh, next slide, please. He was a Catholic, as is the entirety of Sarai. This Catholic identity is an essential component of the residence. While Albania is a predominantly Muslim country, owing to nearly five centuries of Ottoman rule, religion overall in the country is a complicated topic. Next slide, please. This is primarily due to this man, Enver Hoxha. He ruled Albania with one of the most repressive communist dictatorships for 40 years. Under his reign, religion was outlawed entirely. The church in the center of Sarai was one of the only places of worship still in operation under Hoxha's regime. Hoxha wanted to keep the villages in the mountains isolated from the rest of Albania. And so he mostly allowed them to maintain their culture and even had a hydroelectric plant built to provide the village with power in order to keep them placated and in place. Uh, next slide, please. When the communist regime fell and there was newfound freedom of movement, many in the village began to leave, seeking to work in the cities or abroad. Next slide. During the political unrest of 1997, the hydroelectric plant was wholly dismantled, distorting the modest electro electrical infrastructure and exacerbating the flight from the village. Now only 20 people remain. So here's a short piece of footage I took while there this past summer. What is Kanuni? Well, Kanuni is a book written from a person called Lake Dugajini. That was the constitution of, of Albania during that time. There were rules about everything, about marriage, about uh, feasts, about killings. That's where the, the blood thing started. In a corner, uh, we, we, we just in Bandai. The visa, 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 Next slide, please. So just to give a quick, uh, just point out something quick about this photo here. This is my favorite photo that we took on this trip. This man is now 99 years old. He's turning 100 next year. And he was such a saint to us. I just think about all the things that he experienced and witnessed over his life. And he's still such a firecracker. It was amazing. But anyways, moving forward, I plan on finishing this project as my master's thesis. Aside from a survey of the traditions, history, and folk music, there are a wide range of questions I seek to answer. How have opportunities for work in the cities of Albania or abroad altered perceptions of these individuals' homeland in the mountainous villages? Is village identity fortified by the residents' distance as they move to the cities, or do they come to adapt more generalized notions as being Albanian above being from a specific place or region? How has their, their Catholic identity evolved from the uh, atheistic state under communism? How does it interact with their Muslim neighbors in Tripoya? Even in urban settings, do their religious and cultural traditions still hold sway? To what extent does the practice of blood feuds affect and represent notions of honor, justice, and kinship? I intend to submit my final work to the DocuFest, Documentary Festival in Kosovo 
to present these individual stories and history to a broader Albanian audience with the hope of removing some of the stigmatization they face. Perhaps the most rewarding moment of this journey so far was when returning back from the mountains over a much appreciated pizza dinner, the man who translated for me, who initially told me that these are cruel, cold people and cautioned me against doing it in the first place, told me that his perception of his fellow countrymen was changed entirely. He expressed how happy he was to have experienced that and to tell his friends and family about his experiences. I hope for this to be the first step in a lifelong endeavor of opening many minds, my own included. Thank you. No, thank you, Derek. My goodness, I could continue listening to you for a while. <laughs> um, so we have a bunch of questions here for you. So the first one is, you captured a nice collection of scenes in the village. Did you find that the people in those villages welcomed you easily or did you have to do some kind of convincing to not be perceived as an outsider? So it was kind of interesting at first because when I first went up there myself, uh, it had, like I emerged from the woods and like there was people in this village and they just took me in instantly. Their hospitality was incredible. Um, there was no questions about it. And then at the, when I tried to return and try to give them some money for uh, housing me and giving me food, they were absolutely not. They wouldn't take any of it. So when I went back, it was the same sort of deal. The hospitality was incredible. I mean, like I said, it, there's, there's a very strong cultural tradition of uh, treating your guests with the utmost respect and honor. The thing that was a little bit interesting was trying to film. Um, they were a bit apprehensive of that at first, and it took a while for us to sort of get them to open up. Um, so when I went up there with my translator, he was only there for a couple days. And then myself and uh, my other camera operator, we stayed for about another week. And it was sort of during that time when we didn't, we weren't able to speak, uh, we weren't really able to communicate effectively. We didn't speak the same language. Um, that's when we they started to open up. And so this is where I got the music from and that shot of the man playing for us in his house was such a special moment because it was the last night there. And he finally, and, he, and right before we're going to bed, he pulls out uh, his chiftly and he, and he just sort of motions that he's gonna play it. And we watched him as he sort of uh, restrings it. His wife's sitting there like trying, trying to like hold up a phone because there was no lights. We only had like, we had a little um, portable light with us too. And he's like brushing the dust off it. And then he just starts playing and it was just so incredible. And that's when we sort of realized that okay, we can do this. This is why we want to come back. Um, you know, there was other examples of people, you know, they were okay with us filming, like the one man who was also playing the Shifterly in there, he was, he was a riot. <laughs> <laughs> it was amazing. But yeah, so now what, where I'm at now is at a position, now they know me, they know me very well. They remembered me from the first time, they remembered me from this time, and we can go back and actually film and get the stories. No, that sounds absolutely fascinating, a kind of intimacy to this journey where each moment is like you step into the person's world yeah. and you have to see how to navigate meanings that perhaps you have to reconsider in your mind as well and yeah. new customs. I'm getting a lot of questions and uh, I don't know what to do. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> so, huh. All right. Decision making. Mm. Well, if, I mean, I can put my email out if anyone wants to reach out. I'd love to. Yeah, um, that would be great. I think if all of our presenters could put their some kind of contact information, um, as Talisa has done, Lauren as well. Derek, please do that. I'll ask you one more question, and then please add your emails to the chat box aimed at everyone. Uh, so what is their perception of the people who live in the cities? Or are they aware of how others in the country view their villages? So, all right, so let me answer the first part of that. The perception is how they're viewed in the city is, like I said, there's, there's been the stigmatization around the people of the mountains uh, for quite some time, both in terms of um, non-Albanian populations, mostly due to early anthropological, there was a couple of, like a very small handful of early anthropological studies that were done that really, really focused on the violence. Um, there was one woman, and her name escapes me, and it's very unfortunate right now, but in the early 1900s, she became known as the, the Queen of the Mountains because she went up there 
and earned their trust and but like sort of saw and wrote about these sort of violent practices. Now in terms of Albanian's perceptions, what I saw was a very similar idea. Um, like I said, my translator at the very beginning, I mean, he was so not about it. I was kind of, <laughs> it like really scared me at first because I was like, I remember going up there the first time and I was like, no, what are you talking about? They're great. And, and I was like, maybe that was just a fluke. I couldn't sleep the night beforehand. I was so, I was like, how am I, what am I doing? <laughs> um, and I think that's a very, I think that stigmatization is, is sort of widespread, especially in, in the urban centers, which is interesting because uh, most of the people in the village live a, uh, they sort of transition to the city during the winter. Like there's only one man who stays there all winter and I can't believe how, I don't know how he does it. Um, and so that's something I'm very curious about getting is, is how, how is that transition, uh, how, do, how does that transition affect them? How do they, how do they, um, how do they transition into that li sort of lifestyle after living from living in the, in this isolated existence for a while? Um, and I don't know exactly how they view that perception themselves. Again, it's another thing that there was a lot of questions that this opened up for me. This initial trip was mostly about getting a sense of the history sort of laying the groundwork of getting um, getting the connections and meeting the people. And so there's, I mean, I have like a list of the length of my arm of questions that I need to go and figure out. But it does sound like it was a context setting that you're doing at first, and now you can follow yes. on to more specific areas. Yes, exactly. That way I look forward to the follow-ups. I mean, all of our presenters seem like they owe us all follow-ups of amazing, amazing work. We can't wait. So... Um, Kim, I'll pass it over to you again. Thank you all so much. Uh, there are questions there, so uh, please provide your emails if you'd like to, sorry, presenters, please provide your emails if you'd like questions to be directed at you. There are a number in the chat. Then thank you so much, Kim, over to you. Congratulations. Okay, okay thanks, thanks, Marino. Um, and thank you, Joanna, in particular, uh, for organizing this and everybody else who is behind the scenes. Uh, that made all this um, not only happen, but run remarkably smoothly for our first time. As, and I thank all the presenters for that as well, because they were incredibly diligent and patient with us, um, where um, we were trying to you know, get it down um, so that it would run as smoothly as it actually ended up running. So it's really a pleasure um, to have worked with all four of you and everybody else. Um, and you know, it's just, you, you people are just remarkable. Uh, let's, let's face it, that, um, that you are totally diverse in your, what your interests are. Um, and, but what I was thinking that holds you together is, is your passion for what it is that you're doing. Um, each one of you really wants to do what they're doing. Um, and that that, I think, came through really loud and clear to um, everybody who listened to you. Um, and I think that this is what makes CUNY BA students in particular interesting because this is exactly what we're trying to do is to allow students to hold on to that passion and then to develop it into a real um, lifelong learning journey. Um, and that the, all four of you have great um, futures ahead of you. You know, just keep doing what you're doing. Um, and um, and I'm sure that you'll not only be successful, but you'll have wonderful lives as well. Um, so um, I could go on and on, but I just want to also introduce the last speaker, I promise you, um, who is Brian Peterson, who just has some final remarks of his own. Thank you very much, everybody. Such a great way to end a remarkable week. Um, and I want to thank you. You know, when we started planning our first CUNY BA showcase, the idea that we would host the program virtually was the furthest thing from our mind. Uh, we had something completely different um, and in person. And so, one, I, I just want to say we're, I'm so pleased that you four students were willing to not only share your work today and be part of this 
presentation and program, but also to take the risk to explore with us this virtual space that's becoming our new normal. You are polished and poised, and your work is so thoughtful and exciting. Um, but, you know, here today you demonstrated far beyond my capacity, and perhaps many of the others online, uh, deep mastery of the virtual space. Um, I think all of you could also have a career in broadcast journalism, but I, I think I'd like to say keep it focused on the academy, because I think if you all decided to go into teaching, uh, you absolutely would be remarkable. Um, I, I just want to close with gratitude. Um, and gratitude to everybody who joined us today, the faculty mentors, members of the CUNY BA University Committee, CUNY BA and Graduate Center staff, um, and, and most importantly, the family and friends of our student speakers who joined in today and, and participated in watching and, and being part of the chat and the questions. Um, I wanna thank the CUNY BA team and the leadership of Kim Hartswick, uh, just a lifelong dedicated man to this program and uh, really part of the heart and soul of it is long, along with the whole staff. And particular thanks to Joanna and Marino, two of our CUNY BA fellows who took the lead with this project and worked really closely with Derek, Talisa, Corey, and Lauren to, to make it a success. So I close with that gratitude, applause to you all, if we do virtual applause, uh, and, and your efforts into making this a successful event for being with us today. All the best for a happy weekend, um, and thank you all.